Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Wednesday evening with the Clear Mountain Monastery community. I think we'll start off this evening's session with uh, a bit of meditation, maybe just five to ten minutes of settling. So bringing your body to a upright and relaxed position, sitting on the floor on a cushion or on a chair. Whatever you're sitting on, you want your spine to be upright. If you're sitting on the floor, you it can be helpful to have the bottom of the spine a little bit raised. That lets the lumbar vertebrae not collapse backwards and have you just slump forwards. And the head just balancing on the, the top of the spine. Maybe even a feeling like the whole skull is being lifted up by a tiny string. And all the rest of the body's muscles, all the flesh of the body can just relax. And in line with this month's theme of the six sense bases, You can bring your attention to the eyes and see what it feels like. See what these eyes feel like from the inside. You can feel their, their shape, their size. If you move the iris from the pupils from left to right, you can feel the movement on your eyelids. Just knowing the eyes and letting all the musculature around the eyes just relax. can hold so much tension in the eyes. It can hold so much emotion in the eyes. Whether it's greed or liking the eyes narrowing in on whatever it is that we're fixating on. The sphincter muscles of the iris just contracting to focus in on the tiny details of whatever it is that we're wanting and desiring at the moment. Or the movement, if we're being called and beckoned, the mind, the eyes are just wanting to look at beautiful forms moving from here to there, alluring sights, the eyes just darting here and there.
and emotions of anger and aversion. The knitted brow. Just years of subtle and not so subtle and gross, just anger and aversion and hatred and irritation. Just becomes concrete on the face over time in this wrinkles between the two eyebrow. And you can just relax all of that. These are the eyeballs and the musculature which support them. This is the first internal sense base, the chaku ayatana, chakayatana. And the next sense base, internal sense base, is the ears. You can bring your attention to the ear organs, the outer ear that you can see and probably feel most clearly, and even the inner ear if you bring your attention, your what's called interoception just a little bit in from the sides of the ear canal, knowing the inner ear. And just experiencing the ear and seeing if you can, if there's any musculature which you can actually just relax around the ears. Or you might find even like a referent muscular tension from sounds. If you're somewhere where there are unpredictable and loud noises, you might find that other parts of the face or even the shoulders, upper body, might have this pattern of tensing and contracting with the uh, sounds which are unpleasant. Or when you say cock your ear to one side, you're just really trying to pick up all the refinements of your favorite song. Here in meditation, we can just, just let all of that go and just relax. The next organ is the nose, working with the olfactory sense. And here too, there can be muscular tension around the, around the nostrils. And all of that can just relax. And you'll find it can be fascinating when you start exploring the inner felt sense of these different parts of the body, especially ones which we're used to looking out of or listening out of, smelling out of. Oftentimes we don't even know what they feel like in themselves, the organ themselves. And the fourth sense base of the tongue, operating taste and seeing if you can just Relax the whole 
mouth apparatus, the lips, all of the muscles orbiting the mouth, the lips, and letting the tongue just settle freely. There's nothing to taste, nothing to say. And there can be a, a peace in this stilling, this letting go of getting and pushing away habit patterns that have become flesh, that have formed muscular habit patterns. And the fifth internal sense space is the body, the kayatana, just see if you can bring your attention from the top of the head to the soles of the feet, scanning down and just letting any tension that you feel relax. And the sixth sense door is the mind. In Abhidhamma and later texts, the authors suggest that the physical basis of the mind is literally in the heart, the blood of the heart. The blood of the heart muscle. This isn't explicitly said in the earliest texts of the Buddha. But see if you can bring your attention there to the heart. And just know the heart organ from the inside, the beating and the palpitation of the heart. Just knowing that with the mind. Okay, so. That was a brief tour of the internal sense bases. And we'll open it up to questions in just a bit, but to fill out that picture a bit more of these uh, sense bases, the six senses as they're framed in Buddhist discourses, we can look at the other aspects of uh, sensory perception. Uh, which are, it's not just the, the eyeball. Um, corpses have eyeballs and uh, yet yeah, dead bodies, you know, eyeball, uh, eyeball can exist outside of the body. An ear can be cut off, you can have a nose, which is not attached to anything else. And it's just inert matter. Um, and so the seeming magic comes from uh, contact with the eye and uh, and forms and with the ear and sounds with the nose and smells with the tongue and tastes 
with the body and touch and with the mind and ideas. And in addition to those two, so you've got the inner base of the actual uh, organ, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and you've got the external base, which are sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touch. Uh, you need a third factor, which is actual consciousness at these different bases. So eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, body consciousness, uh, tongue consciousness, um, and the mind. So when the three triplets meet, then there's contact. So when you have a intact eye, um, intact eyeballs, which can, uh, you know, are functioning as uh, functioning healthfully, and you've got forms, you've got things which can be seen, uh, and you've got eye consciousness. When these three contact, then there will be a feeling, and from the feeling, then comes the problem, uh, which is craving. So, and it's the same with the, the other senses. When you have ears and sounds and ear consciousness, that's not yet a problem. It's not yet a problem. And even when you add in uh, ear, like feeling at the ear door, whether it's pleasant, painful, or neutral, still, it's no problem. Um, it's just uh, sounds doing what they do. Um, it's the craving that then comes on to that pleasant sound, uh, the painful sound, and the uh, neutral sound. When you glom onto those and you have this craving response or aversive response, uh, that's when uh, we, we start to suffer. And that's when, that's the uh, turning point when we can actually choose not to suffer and just stay with the, um, that basic, uh, contact of uh, this is just an eyeball seeing forms. This is just ears hearing sounds, whether they're pleasant or unpleasant. I don't have to uh, push away from them or grasp after them and run after them. Uh, similarly with smells, you know, I've got this nose, we've got our noses, and uh, you smell beautiful things and you smell repulsive things, and there's the uh, nose consciousness, there's contact, still not a problem, not a problem, no matter how disgusting a smell might be or how beautiful and fragrant a smell might be, still, it's, it's not yet a problem. Um, there's a pleasant feeling from the fragrant things of the world, the jasmine smell, the incense, beautiful, say sandalwood, uh, discourses where the Buddha says that sandalwood is the foremost scent. Um, but from these, there comes uh, a feeling of pleasantness or unpleasant um, olfactory perception. And then the, cra the craving uh, comes on top of that, that feeling, that pleasant or unpleasant. If it's a pleasant feeling, if we start to uh, grasp after it, if we want more of it and start to cling on to it and uh, chase after it, that's the problem. That's the problem. And that's, that will lead to suffering because uh, that will change. So that's smells. And then similarly with tastes, we've got a tongue, not a problem. Tastes, all the tasty things of the world, all the things that we uh, chase after all the things that we try to lock up and prevent ourselves from binging on and uh, eating too much of or uh, all the horrible tastes that we try to uh, not encounter all the time all this energy and effort spent to taste the things that we want to taste and not taste the things that we don't want to taste uh, when it's just the tastes it's still not a problem, um, but it's our, our craving and our desire and lust, which for these sensory things, the beautiful, the tasty tastes of the world, that's, um, that's where the problem comes in. And similarly with touch, we like to uh, feel 
soft and luxuriant things and we bristle and push away from those touches which are uh, prickly and aversive and creepy and crawly and uh, that pushing and pulling that's the the craving but just having a body it's not necessarily uh, going to cause us suffering and the soft blankets and uh, gentle caresses of the world it doesn't have to be a problem uh, and even the, the pleasantness and the painfulness is not necessarily uh, going to lead us to um, experience suffering but when we chase after the good things and uh, move away from the bad things that's when things get uh, troublesome and so it is with the mind and really the mind is the chief the mind is the forerunner the mind is what is doing all of this um, pushing and pulling and this is what we can train so that's great but it's also the hardest to train you know uh, actors can train their you know, dancers can train their bodies actors can train their faces um, uh, say FBI or intelligence officials can train their own eyes uh, all of us you know monks or monks and nuns we're training the way that we look at the world um, and the organs can be can be trained eye ear nose tongue and body um, but the mind it can also be trained but it, it's more difficult it's subtle uh, there are Dhammapada verses where in there's a whole chapter the second chapter of the Dhammapada where the Buddha it's a rather encouraging chapter because the Buddha goes into detail on how hard it is. This is the Buddha saying, uh, difficult is it to train the mind. Uh, the mind is like a cave. It wanders far. It has no body. It uh, is difficult to train and it is so swift and so subtle. Um, so these are encouraging. The Buddha is kind of admitting, you know, and saying, uh, boldly what most of us experience when we come down to meditate when we come to try to still the mind and stay with one object it's difficult to do because the mind is so fast um, but the mind itself is not the problem you've got the uh, mano the sixth sense base that's not yet a problem and thoughts are not yet a problem they're just the clouds of the mind. They're just the, the scenery. They're the shadows and the, the bright lights of the mind. Um, and similarly, consciousness that knows these thoughts, it's not yet a problem. And even uh, the likability or the um, pleasantness and unpleasantness of, of thoughts don't have to be a problem. It's when we form the inevitable uh, or sorry, not inevitable, but when we form the uh, seemingly, and oftentimes seemingly inevitable um, likings and dislikings for um, the pleasant thoughts on the one hand and the unpleasant thoughts on the other hand. When we crave, then we'll suffer because our thoughts, even more so than the body, uh, are so apt and so quick to change. So... Maybe I'll end this talk on this tour of the six senses and their objects and open things up to questions. So people are welcome to post questions in the, uh, the chat on YouTube. And I believe you can also post uh, chats in Facebook as well um, if you have any questions or thoughts. Great. We're seeing lots of uh, people tuning in and good, good friends, people who uh, we know. Hello from people in Europe and people elsewhere. A lot of fair number of people. We got people in Australia. Oregon. Okay. So we've got a uh, first question or reflection so i believe this is is sensor uh, if sense restraint is blocking tanha at a psychological psychological level 
that seems like a really high level practice. Um, it doesn't have to be. It really doesn't have to be. So um, sense restraint or indriya samvara, indriya is another word for these senses. There are a number of words which um, Buddhists will become familiar with. Ayatana is one of them. Indriya is another one. Samvara, vara is like a, a tie or to tie. And sung is to tie around or to tie down in a um, healthy sense, indriya sangbara. Um, it is, in a Buddhist context, spoken of both as being on a psychological level, so um, on the level of the mind, but there is also an allowable level of just physically walking with downcast eyes. This is a, a phrase which you'll hear not infrequently find, not infrequently in the discourses, especially in the Sutta Nipata, uh, the discourse on the rhinoceros horn. Um, you know, it, it appears this okita chaku. Chaku is the eye. Okita, kita means to like to cast down. Ava or o is downwards, downcast eyes. This is um, an image which you often find of monks uh, in the, the Buddhist canon. It's actually one of our training precepts is that monks go about with downcast eyes. And that's not like downcast as in depressed, but just uh, we're not running into a city just, you know, looking here and around and reading every sign and, um, you know, just compulsively uh, looking at all the beautiful sights and uh, steering away from all the uh, aversive sights. So the Buddha did allow and even um, enjoin some restraint of the eye for monks. Um, similarly, we, we and uh, lay people who take the eight precepts uh, choose to avoid and not to see. Literally, you're uh, to some degree putting blinders on what you're allowing your, your eyes to look at. Um, yeah, I undertake the, the precept or I undertake the, the training to refrain from uh, entertainment, beautification, and adornment, or from singing, dancing, music, and going to see theatrical shows. So we're literally not looking when we take on these, we voluntarily take on these precepts. Um, so that's not super high level. That's very uh, doable. Yeah, you can literally just not, not look. Yeah, just looking away. Um, and similarly with with tastes, you know, the people who take on the eight precepts, the sixth precept is not eating afternoon. So, um, yeah, literally not putting things in your mouth during certain times of the day. Um, vegans, vegetarians, or people really with any diet are choosing, you know, this is a, this is a type of sense restraint. This is a gross or coarse or um, practical uh, type of sense restraint, um, just not listening to and tasting and smelling the things which will um, pull us in directions we don't want to go, or at least training. But you're right, the mind is a, the mind is swift, the mind is fast, and um, to be able to work with the mind, um, it does take more finesse. And the Buddha said, yeah, it's not the pretty things of the world that are the problem, it's the lust which we have for those pretty things and the desire which we have, which is the problem. And to catch that lust, that catch that, that kind of glom on, that initial kind of chasing point um, does take some subtlety. But in addition to uh, working on our quickness with which we uh, catch the mind craving after sights, the mind craving after sounds, smells, taste, taste, touch. There's an additional aspect, a different aspect of sense restraint, which is actually an intelligence around which aspects of our sensory perception of the sight, sound, smells, taste, touch, we're paying attention to. So, um, and then paying attention more intelligently. Like if you, you know, really hate um, Japanese, um, calligraphy and art, then uh, you might not want to look at this part of the screen. Or if you're averse to bald people, 
then maybe you don't want to look you know from here up uh, on the monk on the screen um, and similarly with with sounds you know if uh, we're listening to our boss we can pay particular attention to every time they smack their lips or every time they you know say that annoying catchword like you know or every time they make their voice a bit squeakier than we like we can pay attention to something else um, even within that same sense realm so if it sounds then rather than paying attention to on the aversive spectrum uh, rather than paying attention to all of the things we don't like all of the filler words which we're annoyed with or all of the uh, sound you know the the highs and lows of the our enemy's voice we can pay attention oh this is just sound this is just speaking so the buddha talked about this as paying attention to or not paying attention to the signs and features of sight sound smells taste touch which actually uh, elicit greed and anger so that's um, something which uh, we can work with on a, a less high level than the speed with which we catch things so we want to be working both on the speed with which we're able to catch our uh, motions of pushing and pulling away from sight sound smells taste touch but also work at our skill about both knowing ourselves what it is that we like and don't like um, or crave towards or averse against and then yeah being smart about it looking more specifically you know listening more skillfully so i hope that helps good question next question hi anjan oh hello angela i was wondering how exactly does meditation cultivate merit so this is referring to the Pali concept of punya, which is merit. And in the earliest discourses, it said that there are three large realms of merit, which are stana, which is generosity, sila, which is um, morality or virtue, and bhavana, which is often translated as meditation, but literally means causing to come into being the root is uh, bu, which means to be. And when you uh, make it a causative, bhav, bhaveti, um, that's causing to come into be. That's, yeah, so cultivating or cultivation or bringing into be, that's a more literal translation than uh, meditation. So if in your meditation you're bringing wholesome mind states into be such as uh, calm and relaxation and one-pointedness and feelings of loving kindness and if you're uh, allowing unwholesome states like aversion and um, uh, ill will grasping envy jealousy all these unwholesome things if you're letting those die away then that's uh, that's what is meant by bhavana. You're cultivating and letting go. Um, and how is that merit? Uh, I think it, why it might not seem like a logical jump is because like the Buddha didn't use the word merit. Merit's a very, um, it partially fits the context of punya, but it's, uh, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's not a good translation for other reasons. Like in English, merit one, it's a uncommon word. Two, you know, when it is used, it's um, almost in a transactional sense or in a kind of goody two-shoes Boy Scout sense, like you're getting your, your merit badge. Um, it does fortunately have a positive connotation, which it certainly does in a Buddhist context. Uh, punya, or the Pali word boon, which it comes from, or which comes from it, um, have wholly positive connotations. So punya is wholly positive. There's none of this 
goody two shoes or kind of holier than thou sanctimonious um, aspect to punya. Um, so how is dana punya? How is generosity punya? That's obvious. It it, it brightens the mind. It, it's bringing up wholesome states. Um, similarly, um, morality. That's punya in the sense that it's cultivating and bringing up bright mind states. And with bhavana, that's almost like the most direct form. So meditation as a direct form of punya or merit or in a near synonym of punya is kusala, which is the wholesome. So in meditation, we're bringing about the wholesome. So um, this is... Uh, yeah, a broader conception of meditation and of um, mind cultivation than is encapsulated in the narrow English word meditation, where many people just conceive of meditation as being sitting on a cushion, preferably cross-legged, and focusing your mind on one object. And if you're doing that skillfully, if you're doing that in a balanced way, um, that is sitting on a cushion and focusing on one object. If you're doing that in a balanced way and the mind is becoming bright, the mind is becoming settled, the mind is relaxing, you know, those states, tranquility, relaxation, one-pointedness, you, those are bringing about wholesome mind states. And in that sense, meditation is cultivation, is bhavana, is punya, is kusala, is merit, is wholesome. But if your meditation is not bringing about wholesome mind states, but is actually bringing up aversion, if you're um, yeah, clamping down on your meditation object, uh, not allowing um, enjoyment to arise, and if your meditation is just becoming dry and uh, a vehicle for self-aversion, then that's not bhavana and that's not merit. Um, so it's good to actually be paying attention to this. You know, oftentimes, uh, especially in people coming new to uh, meditation, it can be so technique oriented that you become so fixated on the technique. I'm paying attention to the breath right here, in, out, in, out, in, out. Or I'm scanning the body top to bottom, bottom to top, top to bottom, looking at sensations. Focus so much on the technique, so much on the um, minutia of what what it is you're doing that you are lacking a broader perspective of is this actually bringing about wholesome mind states because it's possible to focus on the in and out breathing uh, or on scanning the body from top to bottom or looking at a mantra or whatever it is in a way which is actually kindling more aversion so you really want to be paying attention to this and uh, um, yeah is your meditation bhavana is your meditation meritorious? Long answer, but I uh, hope that helps. Uh, Venerable, can you share reflections on skillful means when having distorted senses? My sense of smell, taste, are and taste are impaired. My body experiences normal touch as painful. Yeah, so there's a word in Pali called uh, vipalasa, which literally can be translated as distortion. So, or even perversion. So there are three types, types of vipalasa or distortion. See if I can remember this. They do appear in this, our current chapter on, uh, of Buddha Dhamma. You've got sanya vipalasa, so distortion of perception. You've got ditti vipalasa, distortion of views. And you've got uh, views, perception, and... Maybe it'll come to me, or maybe someone can put it into the, the chat if, it, if you're remembering it. Um, yeah, so there are many areas and ways that we can, our senses and our perception of the world can become distorted. Um, and yeah, we can start out with organs themselves, you know, which are impaired. We might be, uh, we might have a vision we might have vision loss to some or some total degree. 
uh, or smell, taste, or we might be deaf partially or completely. Um, or similarly, yeah, people, there are people who experience um, either extreme sensory input um, with what would be normal in other people, or people who have virtually no um, pain receptors. So, um, yeah, and working with it, it can be a gift and it can be a curse. You know, um, dukkha vedana can be the cause for a rising of, of faith. Yeah, this is, there's a, um, a sutta in the, a discourse in the Indriya or the Vedana Sangyuta, Salayatana, Nidana Sangyuta, I think, where the Buddha talks about uh, dukkha or pain being a, a cause for the arising of, uh, of faith. So look at that. That's, that's one thing to look at. And um, yeah, we can, to some extent, we can only do what we can do with the organs that we've been, been dealt. You know, there, uh, science can do something, you know, you can get cochlear implants to improve uh, your sense of hearing, you can get glasses or different types of surgery, uh, LASIK surgery to improve your eyesight, but they can only do so much. Um, and really to some extent, the eyes will never see the world as it is. The ears will never hear the world as it is. The human eye, the human ear, the human nose, the human tongue, the human body can only know a certain range of, of sensory input. Yeah, we don't know, we don't see the ultraviolet spectrum. We don't uh, hear hypersonic or, you know, there's only a certain frequency range that the human ear can pick up. So we're never going to hear things as they are. But I think the, what the Buddha is pointing to is uh, at least removing our, um, let, let me rephrase that, we'll never see the totality of the visual world as it could be experienced by um, some being. We'll never hear the totality of possible sounds. And even if we could, I don't know if that would be desirable, it would just be an, an overwhelming cacophony. Um, so putting that aside, that we'll never feel and experience the, the whole of the sensory uh, world, um, really what the Buddha is telling us to do is work with exactly what you're pointing to, uh, work with our aversion to pain and our desire for pleasure. So uh, thank you for the question and yeah, um, all metta to all of us in our attempts to, to work with, with our pains. Hello, Venerable. I've been working with your advice of switching my attention from the object of vision with sights that trigger lust. Could you discuss the t -t technique some more? Yeah. Um, we've got quite a few uh, more questions. Apologies. Uh, we've only got one more minute. Um, and we will then go to Zoom. So um, if you go to clearmountainmonastery.org, you can go to calendar and then click on the link for today's Zoom session. And we'll go over there and have a more of a discussion, which is great. So if for the people whose questions I didn't get to, apologies for that. And um, I, yeah, I'll see if I can touch on these in a future session. Um, but just in answering this question about switching attention, uh, yeah, this is a, a serious meditative skill. This is a this needs to be in our our meditative and our Buddhist uh, toolbox tool belt. Is but there are no um, carte blanche. There's no uh, definitive and absolute answers with this. Every individual is so uh, unique. Those. Signs and features, the nimitta and bionjana, which I'm attracted to and repulsed by, will be different from you. So it, it, it really does just become a matter of your own testing and uh, figuring out what your triggers are. And um, yeah, 
paying attention in, in different ways. So I apologize that's um, less than satisfactory response, but um, uh, I do appreciate uh, it is good to um, yeah, discuss these things with friends. So I hope the discussion can continue over on Zoom and we will be in person actually this coming Saturday. We will not be at St. Mark's uh, as per usual, but we've got a day-long retreat with Bhante Sudasu and Ayasoma. Uh, the theme is JOMO, the joy of missing out, which points to uh, sense restraint as well. And that will be a day long at Fauntleroy Choice Church. I believe there are uh, spots both in person and on Zoom. You can go to Humanitix or just go to our website for more information on how to sign up. And then there's also an event on Sunday uh, in Volunteer Park, uh, I believe at 3 p.m. And for those who can join, that's wonderful. And for those who can't, then maybe we'll see you next week at the same time at 6 p.m. And Wish everyone the best and see those who can over on Zoom. Okay, good night, everyone.